Hello everyone and welcome to today's webinar, the latest in our SAGE Talk series. Today's webinar will be on teaching public policy, tips on engaging your students, and inspiring active participation. Let me begin by introducing you to our speaker, Sarah Rinfrey. Sarah is an Associate Professor of Political Science at the University of Montana, Missoula. She's the Director of the Master of Public Administration Program and Co-Director of the Social Science Research Laboratory. Before we get started, I want to let you know that this webinar will be recorded and archived for future viewing. We will be sending out a link to view the recording as well as the presenter slides in the coming week. If any of you have any problems with audio or viewing mode during the webinar, please use the question and answer box at the right of your screen and one of our helpful team members will get back to you as soon as possible. At the end of the webinar, we will have some time for question and answer from attendees, so please also use the chat box to ask any questions to the speaker throughout the webinar. Please also note the webinar hashtag, Sage Talk and feel free to ask questions or leave comments there as well. In today's webinar, we will be discussing how to get public policy students excited about today's policy issues and inspire them to actively participate in the ever-changing world of public affairs. We will demonstrate how to get students to look beyond simple pros and cons of popular policy debates to examine the multifaceted dimensions of decision-making and the complexities inherent in real-world problem solving. We know not every student starts out engaged in public policy, but Sarah Rinfrey will show how to put students in the driver's seat by fostering their analytical skills and applying them to current policy examples that matter the most to them. After hearing from Sarah Rinfrey, we'll move on to a question and answer session, where Sarah will answer questions that you've submitted via the question box as well as those you tweet out using the Sage Talks hashtag. We will do our best to get all questions answered, but if we're not able to get to all of them today, we'll allow Sarah the opportunity to respond to those offline and we'll include a link to her answers after the event. So without further ado, let me turn the mic over to Professor Sarah Rinfrey. Sarah, uh, if you are speaking, we're not able to hear you. Great. Thanks, everyone, and thanks to Jennifer. I'm really excited to, to chat with everyone today about some tips in teaching public policy. I've taught public policy for about the last decade, and often it's, it's difficult to teach, um, especially from a political science perspective. You have many students from across the disciplines that might not be um, as engaged or taking it as a required course. And so I want to share with you today, over the last decade, in my experiences teaching at the undergraduate and graduate level, and how you can bring in a range of backgrounds to really engage our students in public policy and inspiring them to be active participants in the process. So what I would like to do today is just talk about um, the structure of the course, so the course format and setting up the syllabus. And then I'm going to offer a new approach. Um, we've often been taught that doing debates in public policy is a bimodal distribution, so us versus them. And I'm going to discuss an example that I piloted um, about a year ago and continue to use in using debate panels to help students find a middle ground. And then I'm going to close with how we can use this as 
for scholarship for teaching and learning. So it's really important for us um, in sharing the, the things that we're doing in the classroom with a broader audience through the scholarship of teaching and learning. So the course that I use um, is set up across 14 to 16 weeks, so the normal semester. And so thinking about this in terms of how we can be more tangible ways for students to realize the benefits of public policy. And so I'll share with you in a moment, but thinking about how we design our course syllabus in um, a Monday, Wednesday, Friday format, or Tuesday, Wednesday format, or a Tuesday, Thursday format. And so really looking at how we can reframe public policy in engaging our students to participate in the process more broadly. So like I said, um, you can teach this at the undergraduate or graduate level. And the way that I design my course syllabus or the schedule, I've taught this in a Monday, Wednesday, Friday. And the example I'm going to share with you today is Tuesday, Thursday. So Monday, Wednesday, Friday. Um, Monday, usually just a lecture. Wednesday will be current events. And then Friday would be the debate panels, which I'm going to share. And then um, this past year, I did the Tuesday, Thursday format. So Tuesday was a lecture. And then Thursday allowed the students to really engage in these debate panels. The other really important thing, too, in designing your syllabus, and something that I have used for the last decade, is a firing option. So within my syllabus, and I'm always happy to share this with folks too, is that students, um, when they form their teams for the debate panel project, they will sign a contract. And that contract holds the students accountable in their group. And if someone is not doing their work, they can actually fire a student. Um, and I always tell the students what we practice in the classroom is really important for what we do in the real world. So if they do end up getting fired, they um, will have to do a separate assignment. The other point, too, that's really important that I have in the syllabus in day one is that public policy is about participation and coming to class. And so I often have students doing in-class assignments or you know, when we do these debate panels that they're expected to be there. And if not, they don't get points for coming to class. So the idea is that if you want to be participatory, that you need to show up to class and engage with your classmate in important topic areas. So this gives you a snapshot on the way in which I set up the course syllabus. Um, I really try to look at the foundation the first couple weeks with why, public, why study public policy, what is the impact in terms of federalism and looking at the relationships between the state, the local, and the federal level, and then looking at our institutions, so Congress, the courts, the president, and that's when we really dive into that Tuesday, Thursday, so the lecture, and then the lecture helps to apply the students to the debate panel. So one example here is in the course syllabus, I have um, a schedule where it says, you know, what future approach should the U.S. take regarding immigration policy? And then I'll get into in a moment about how students then sign up for these debate panel teams, and then they have to uh, investigate different perspectives. They present that to the class. And then I'll talk about what the students do that are not debating. So the broader question, again, is how can we engage our students in applied learning experience? And in particular here, what I want to share is how can debate panels provide a mechanism for students to find a middle ground? And like I began the talk with today is that we've been taught at a very young age that in public policy or in politics more broadly, us versus them. There's You have to pick one side. And so this is really pushing our students to think more broadly that public policy making is very messy, but it's also looking at a variety of different perspectives. So before I jump into the details of the mechanics of the debate panels, again, you know, we know from the academic literature that using debates in the classroom are not without criticism, but I really want to document a new way for us to move past that us versus them mentality and a mechanism for active learning. As professors, it's often really easy to do the tell-sell approach where we just lecture and talk at our students. And so if we want them to be you know, informed participants of the process, we have to allow students to be able to more thoroughly define a topic 
but also understand the importance of engaging in public policy. So I'm going to share again uh, an example from fall 2017, about a year ago, and I'm redoing this now at the graduate level. This is my undergraduate public policy class. It met for an, um, an hour and 20 minutes on Tuesdays and Thursdays. It's a political science elective, but it's also an elective for a climate change studies minor. We have a uh, major in forestry um, and also communication studies that this is offered as an elective. I had 30 students in the class, and one of the larger assignments were for students to participate in a debate panel. And so they had to sign up for one topic area of their choice. They would serve in teams of three or four. If you were not debating, you were part of the audience. And I'll talk about how, what the role of the audience was. So after the, the third week of the semester, after we had a foundation of defining what public policy is, students then, we have a learning management system, which I'm sure most of you have as well, uh, called Moodle. And I created a link for students on a Google Doc where they would sign up for teams of three or four. And so when they sign up for those teams of three or four, that is when they would start to, the syllabus listed the, the debate panel question, and so they had to work with the other team. So even though it might be the opposing side, they had to decide you know, what perspectives each respective team, so there'd be two teams per topic area, what they would research. Um, and then, if you were not part of the debate team, you would be a non-debater. And so your entry point coming into class was a debate question. And so you had to have a question um, that could be asked to a variety of perspectives based upon the reading for the day. And they had to ask why it was a question, why the question was a good question and had to cite evidence for that. Um, one of the foundations that we used Throughout the semester was a core reading. Um, there's a journal of political science or uh, public administration education. Uh, Monahan wrote a really great article about the difference between a scientific fact and a political fact. So before we even launched into the debate panels, we had an active discussion about what is a scientific fact, what's the process for peer-reviewed research. Um, we met with a librarian that came in and talked about this too, and then what happens when politicians take that information and turn it into a, science, a political fact, so a sound bite. The students that would do the Thursday debate panels um, would have to put together an outline. So every student, if you're a team of three or four, you had to individually put together your own outline. This was an example of how they prepared for their presentation. Um, but also had to demonstrate that they collectively worked together. So it was a streamless presentation from one teammate to the next. Each perspective would do an opening statement, a couple of minutes. Then each side had about 10 minutes to present their facts. And then we would open to the question round with a non-debater. So we would rotate. I would have a student that when the students would walk into class, they drop their questions into a basket. And then another student would ask the questions and then they would do closing statements. Each student that was not debating was required to write down a list of facts uh, during the presentations. At the end of the class period, we'd spend some time doing fact checking so they could get out their laptop or their cell phone or their iPad. And then we'd have a broader conversation about, okay, these are the perspectives that we heard today. Um, what are, let's go through some fact checks, so let's fact check the information, so going back to that core reading, the scientific fact versus the political fact, so did your classmates turn facts into a political fact, and then we had a collective discussion about, okay, so we've been taught to do a bimodal distribution or dualism and learning about immigration policy or public lands, but what are some ways that we could find a middle ground, and so what students then had to do at the end of the semester is everyone participated in one of the debate panels. You know, they had to, you know, offer a variety of questions throughout the semester on topics, but really reflecting on how do we move beyond dualism and public policy and being active participants in the process. 
So this shows the rubric that I use for students to be graded for this particular assignment. This is listed in the syllabus. And so even though it was an individual grade, it looks at the way in which they were able to work with their group members. So they were, do they collectively work together to present a particular perspective about a public policy? They would turn in this outline at the end of their presentation, um, but really helping them to enhance their critical thinking, their research ability, but also one of the things that we've been working on too is, is that they're able to convey this in an oral presentation, which some students often struggle with, but appreciated the, the um, capacity to be able to do so. So with all this said and, and moving into you know, the example of trying to engage our students to be active participants in public policy can also allow us as the faculty member to engage in the scholarship of teaching and learning. So I can put together, went through the institutional review board process, and at the end of the semester, students took this survey and they used a scale of one to five, one meaning that they disagreed and five meaning they strongly agreed. And just looking at whether or not um, this new debate panel format made them more informed about U.S. public policy making, whether or not they're able now to decipher a political fact from a scientific fact, whether or not um, they will be more likely now to fact check statements made in the news, and if they feel more comfortable talking about controversial topics, and then whether or not they would you know, work in the public sector upon graduation and who is more apt to uh, run for office. And then students have the ability at the end to have some of their own comments or questions or concerns in addition to their final reflection paper. So looking at the breakdown, even though I had 30 students in the class, um, when we took the survey, I think 27 were there. And so it looks in terms of the, the gender um, makeup. So more female students in the class. And again, this was a upper level undergraduate class. So the vast majority were 21 to 25. I did have a, two graduate students um, in the course. And then again, most of the students in the class. So looking at some of the findings um, in the responses from our students that were in this class, one of the things that really stood out were that the, the debates did not make them less informed, it made them more informed, that it helped enhance their ability to decipher political fact from scientific fact. And I think this is one of the most remarkable things is that even though we have this scan and skim culture where we're digesting a lot of information through social media, the students said they have a really hard time on Instagram or Snapchat or Facebook that there's so much information um, and, and having that conversation about how you appropriately fact check something. And then also too, I think the, the larger takeaways from the class is that their ability to actively listen to others. In their reflection paper, they said, you know, even in high school, that when you do debates that you're really strongly arguing against someone else and that you never take a time to step back and listen to others. And so that really forced them, number one, to have to work with a team, but also to be able to listen to others and, and really trying to find a common ground. And so every Thursday we take a step back and say, what can we do to find a common ground? What's going on here? Um, and how can we move past this bimodal lens? And, and they all talked about how it was a lot of really hard work but rewarding that even though you might not be a winner or a loser, you might not get everything that you want, but having the ability to have a conversation with someone and understand the other side instead of shouting at them. So with that said, um, I think it takes a little bit more work on our end as a faculty member to engage and offer active learning experience for our students. It's really up to us to make sure that our students are informed participants in the process by understanding public policy from a multiple vantage points. It allows us to, as professors, to engage in the scholarship of teaching and learning to share with others. It's, it's really exciting and 
Um, even though I'm at the University of Montana, that really uh, focuses a lot on research, but we have within our unit standards uh, for tenure and promotion to embrace the scholarship of teaching and learning, so it promotes an environment of collaboration. And also, too, something that we are really excited about, because of work like this, as a, as a professor and as a scholar, I've often been really struggling with what books to use in my class because you know, you're training your students to kind of feed into this us versus them. And so I was really fortunate to work with two colleagues, uh, Denise Cheverly and Michelle Pouts, where the foundation for our new textbook, the uh, public policy concise introduction, at the end of each uh, policy area, we have policy choices. So we have a topic and it gives students a menu of options to engage in and say public policy is not just us versus them. It's a way for us to actually look um, through a variety of perspectives and trying to find that middle ground. And so this is what I was really excited to share with you today, and I look forward to your questions, and thanks for, for joining the conversation. Thank you, Sarah. Awesome. Okay. Um, let's move into our question and answer session. Again, we're answering questions that have come into the question box to the right of the main presentation screen, um, or those that have come in from Twitter using the hashtag SageTalks. Finally, if we can't get to all your questions by the end of the hour, Sarah has kindly agreed to address them in a follow-up blog post on our blog, Sage Connection. So our first question that has come in Sarah, is do you find the students are good fact checkers? Have any of the debates gotten out of hand with students bringing in outside biases? Yeah, I, that's a really good question. Um, you know, there was one, public lands in the West is a really hot topic, and so our students, you know, they're fifth generation Montanans, and so I think that was probably one of the, the more contested issues, but I think um, students that were part of the debate panel, um, they offered some different perspectives, but then being able to fact check that, so we really worked on that throughout the semester, um, and they would call each other on and say, hey, you're using a source that is really biased, and why are you doing that, having that conversation, but yeah, there was one instance where a student, um, I think just got really got, got into it because it was very passionate and he's from a, a ranching family. But then we opened it back up and he talked about the importance of, of working together and we did that collectively as a class. So I don't think, you know, I've done kind of the normal debates where students shout at each other and we, we didn't have anything like that. And I think students really appreciated that they were presenting as a panel, um, experts, and, and then engaging and answering questions. Great. Um, and there was a question about whether or not this activity would work with a, a larger class that's bridging on about 100 students. Yeah, absolutely. I have a colleague that's going to try this for U.S. government, and he has 200 students. Um, he has a teaching assistant. I know not all student, all universities have teaching assistants, but he's doing a smaller scale um, where they're going to just be expert panels presenting information and still doing questions for participation. And so he's doing this. Um, the groups are a little bit larger. Um, but yeah, I think this is definitely doable. And, um, and the way he's even talked about splitting up the class, having half the class come to one part of the class and half the other. And so yeah, I think it's definitely doable. Great. Um, and there was a question, I know you mentioned immigration as a topic, what are some of the other topic areas and are some um, more popular than others? Do some students get stuck with things that they don't want to do? You know, I've moved to an approach where students can pick, so I always tell them, hey, it's open on Moodle, you can sign up, so first come gets priority in terms of signing up, but I always encourage students to sign up for a topic that they don't know a lot about. And so we did immigration policy, public land policy, healthcare, um, 
it was interesting we did welfare policy, which a lot of students seem to be bored about, but that was probably one of the, the better ones just because students then realized how complex it really is. Um, and then I had them rank um, in terms of interest when we were done, but then we had a conversation too and saying, well, even though something might be more exciting than um, welfare policy that they just appreciated learning about something that they'll need to learn about when they graduate. So um, I think pushing them to just don't do something just because it's like the sexier topic. Um, and I think they appreciated that. Great. Um, and can you talk a little bit more about how you grade the students at the end of the semester, how you go about determining their level of research and participation? Yeah, so I showed the rubric, and so the rubric's in the syllabus, and so I do a rubric for, um, I actually just been, I've been going to the APSA Teaching and Learning Conference, which has been really, really helpful in designing rubrics and having students have pointed feedback, and so they would get that feedback. Um, I would usually meet with the debate teams beforehand if they had questions, so their outline, um, and so they were very clear in terms of like, this is what I'm being assessed on. But then the other piece is the students that weren't debating had to either handwrite or type it out um, a question and why it's a good question. And it took a couple weeks for students to figure out why the question they were asking was a good question and using evidence to do that. Um, and so that was, those, each of those were five points a piece. Um, and so we worked through that and talked um, collectively as a class. And then at the end of the semester, the reflection piece is just a broader reflection of what they learned and using evidence to, su to support. So really the entire semester, one of the foundation points is that in public policy, using evidence, how do you convey that to a larger audience and how is it used? And so there's just different pieces. So one chunk was the, the debate panels and then the participation piece and then the final reflection. And they also do have an exam midway through that's an open book exam. Um, but the participation piece too, I usually do points for my classes. So 75 points out of the semester. So in addition to doing coming to the class, I often do in-class activities where if you're not there, you don't get points for it. Um, and so I always tell the students, you know, you come to class, you learn something, and then you get participation points for that. Great. And um, another question, you're, you've talked mostly about using this in your undergraduate course, but you said you've used it for graduate as well. Mm -hmm. Is there anything you modify, and is there a big difference between doing this with undergraduates versus graduate students? Yeah, so I did this for, um, I teach human resource management at the graduate level for our Master's of Public Administration program. So I used this, and I think graduate students are just interesting in general. Um, I think oftentimes undergraduates are really excited to try new things. And I think for HR, um, it took a couple weeks for students to get into it, but then it's a professional degree, and so most of these students are already experts within their own field. And so I do think that really helped to talk about some more controversial issues within HR, so sexual harassment or, um, and just having broader questions linked to human resource management policy and very similar format. Um, they were maybe graded at a higher level in terms of their presentation and their outlines are longer and um, they had to do a longer paper at the end too in, in terms of linking back to allowing public administration to move forward in some of these, these areas moving beyond compliance in a more collaborative HR environment. Okay. Um, and one instructor teaches an eight-week course in public policy. How would you suggest modifying to fit this to a shorter course? Yeah, I, I did something similar. We had, um, my previous institution where I taught, we have, had a January term. And so depending on the class size, and I don't know how many days a week that this person meets, but um, I think that you would just maybe cut back on the amount of topic areas that you have. Um, but I do think 
it, it really pushes students to think outside the box, and I think that's the important thing. Um, but yeah, I'm happy to help too if people have questions. Great, and um, those are all of the questions that have come in so far. Again, if you're listening in and would like to pose a question, um, on the right-hand side of your screen, under the questions area, you can pose any questions you have. Are there any kind of last-minute comments you would like to make, Sarah, to the group? No, just thank you so much for joining today, and, and I think it's it's just a new way to engage our students, and um, it's really important right now. So thank you. Great. Thank you, everyone, for joining us today uh, for our SAGE talk. Please be on the lookout for an email that includes a link to view this entire webinar on our website and the presenter slides that you've seen today. Thanks for your attention. We hope you'll join us for another SAGE Talk webinar again soon. You can visit sagepub.com slash sagetalks for more information, and have a great day.